you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's actually quite nice speaking after Mark, because I think some of the things I'm going to talk about very much tie in with the approach that Mark is wanting to take. So that was really encouraging to see <laughs> the projects and the reinforcing this. So yeah, this, uh, this talk is, is based on my ongoing PhD research about, as you can see for the title, Romano British religion, how we approach it, how we present it in museums, but particularly from the, the approach of experiential religion, lived religion, how people are actually living and experiencing their, their religious lives in the Romano British period. Because we have to kind of bridge um, and reconcile this diverse religious landscape in Roman Britain. That on the one hand, we have the formal worship of you know, named, often classical deities at very formal, structured religious sites such as temples. But on the other hand, we have a religious landscape where people are using wells and pits and ditches to you know, bury babies with puppies and putting strange conglomerations of you know, animal bones and ceramics and things together. So it's a really diverse landscape that I think in museums we have a responsibility to properly and fully capture if we're going to get the range of experiences of the people that we're, we're covering. I'm going to say a huge amount about um, Ro yeah, Roman theory, that's, that's not the thing for today, but just to say that my research is coming from what is now the, the dominant approaches to Roman Britain, uh, which is a, a post-colonial approach. That's basically the idea of rejecting some of the more traditional paradigms of what this homogenous group of Romans and this equally homogenous group of natives or native Britons um, are coming from. As I say, many of you curate Roman collections and will be well aware of this, but it's rejecting this idea of the Romans being, in, in true Monty Python fashion, um, the sophisticated bringers of you know, towns, roads, architecture, government, economics, art, culture, etc. The, the proactive and very mobile providers of civilization to um, people such as the, the Britons who are universally or traditionally portrayed as semi-naked, spiky-haired, tattooed, woad-painted, dirty, savage, illiterate barbarians, um, they are the static and passive receivers of that, of that civilization. And of course, since the early 90s, the move has been to reject such what now almost seem ridiculous um, characterizations. That's often known as the Romanization debate. And so I don't want to go into this too much, I want to get onto the subject, but it's worth just, just highlighting it for people that aren't aware of it. Um, I think best summed up by David Mattingly in his 2006 uh, book, An Imperial Possession, where he said, under this simple model, Romanization, the Romans brought the gifts of towns, villas, language, art, and culture to grateful provincials, and it was assumed that all of them perceived Roman culture as self-evidently superior to what they had before. Britons were thus depicted as enthusiastic participants in Roman lifestyle, with society undergoing progressive cultural evolution under Rome. Early excavation of Roman period sites in Britain focused on Roman forts, towns, and villas, creating a research agenda predisposed to support these assumptions precisely because it focused on those elements of romano British society that were most closely aligned with a Roman identity. So you can see there the rejection of those, of those biases. The quote at the bottom um, was by Clark and Hunter in 2001 uh, when the still current displays at the um, National Museum of Scotland were being put together. And they commented in an article they wrote about the process of putting the Roman displays together, that despite these growing challenges at the time to the orthodox interpretations of Roman Britain, there was surprisingly little commentary on the impact they have had on the presentation of the suffer offered to a wider public by museums. And 18 years on, I'm sorry to say that apart from the few specific insights into certain displays, generally that's, that still holds true. We're still not really engaged with how we're getting these sorts of messages of new, and I hate to use the word, but paradigms of Roman Britain um, to the public. So as part of my research, I'm going around, and I will talk about what I'm doing um, at the end of the, the talk, but kind of going around museums, surveying what's actually going on, analyzing displays and interpretational language. I wanna make it really clear from the start, this isn't about picking up individual displays and saying, oh, somebody at some museum could have done that display or that label differently, or, you know, if they had 10,000 words on this label and a million pound virtual reality budget, all the things they could have done. It's about looking more holistically about how we're approaching the subject generally. So the, the little text here, um, it's just from a selection of introductory panels to Roman religion sections in museums. Just, just to illustrate the point, I think, that we still have problems with the approaches being taken. The key word here for me is what you can see at the bottom left there, tolerant. It appears right throughout these, these panels. This idea of a group of Romans possessing all of the agency and allowing, tolerating native peoples to continue with their beliefs, I think, strikes at a heart of, you know, we've still got a problem with the way we're, we're portraying this. This isn't necessarily telling a story of a nuanced hybridity going on in religious practices. This isn't about colonial encounters and new religious practices being formed, which is what a lot of the academic consensus now, now talks about. This is still very much about a group of Romans being the ones imposing the systems. So 
this is why I think you know, taking a, a wider look at the interpretation across museums can get to the heart of how we're doing this. But so it's not necessarily about spending huge amounts of money, it's about how we're actually approaching from the outset concepts of, of religion, religious experience, and, and hybrid religious communities. So I apologize for the amount of text on this one. Um, so I'm, I'm starting from a, a deliberately provocative, deliberately challenging hypothesis about how we are presenting Romano-British religion. I'm doing that fully aware that there are lots of examples of lots of amazing museums doing things differently to this, but I'm setting this as a, a low benchmark. And as I go around and do the surveying over the next year or two of all the museums, I will be able to rip this up and say, actually, do you know what? We're doing this a lot better than I, than I think we are. Um, but no, generally, religion being presented as a category distinct from daily life, the perpetuation of a, a sacred, profane dichotomy, literally putting religion in its own box, its own glass box. Um, I'm interested in this sense, actually, in how it's being positioned within displays as well. Is, is religion something that's been tucked at the end of a sequence of Roman Britain, you know, kind of at the unpopular back end of the displays, just beyond agricultural production? Or is it being placed front and centre with the sexy Roman army? You know, is it, yeah, how is it being perceived within the wider Romano British displays? Is it being focused on the worship primarily of named anthropomorphic deities? in specific places of worship, such as temples? Are we focusing on that one end of the spectrum and not about all the whole mass of ritual activity and funny goings on that we, that we see, you know, the structured deposition and this sort of side of things? I'm proposing that it's generally predicated on the existence of a single religious system within Roman Britain, with this harmonious melting pot, as it's often described, of native deities, imported deities, syncretized deities. I think a lot of the way we interpret the process of syncretization is something that needs to be looked at as well. Um, that remains chronologically static, except for often an abrupt 4th century transition to, to Christianity. So how that's all being presented. That we're in danger of perpetuating very outdated culture historical modes of thinking about Roman Britain. So downplaying the continuities of Iron Age culture and belief and some of the hybridised religious practices that we now think were actually being formed within the province. That terminology such as religion, ritual, cult, magic, even basic words like gods, aren't generally being defined in displays. Um, that the, the vast amounts of scholarly debate, particularly within anthropology, but, but seeping more into archeology span about how we can apply them to the ancient world isn't necessarily being engaged with. As we know, because these words have currency in modern English, if we don't explain them to our visitors, they are gonna take their modern understandings of those words and apply them to the past. So misunderstandings can be brought in right from the outset, just from visitors' understanding of some of these basic, basic terms. And then finally, that our displays are generally dominated by often decontextualized small finds that have been selected mostly for their aesthetic qualities um, and then juxtaposed on display by their material or by broad functional or typological categories. Um, generally as well, that, that functionalist interpretations are dominating, that there are objects that might have religious connotations or have been shown to have ritual connotations such as lamps, bells, unguent bottles, but that have been displayed primarily as for lighting the home or for cosmetics and makeup. So there's potential religious, religious applications that aren't necessarily being engaged with in displays. So that's my, my kind of hypercritical um, benchmark for, for starting this. So what are the sorts of things I'm actually intending to look at and analyze displays on as, I, as I'm going around? One of the key things I want to look at is the concept of lived ancient religion. Now the, the phrase belongs specifically to a project that ran at the University of Erfurt in Germany between 2012 and 2017. Um, Jörg Rupke um, is, a, is a major scholar of Mediterranean Roman religion. He's the one who led on the project. Lived ancient religion is very much a branch of what anthropologists would term vernacular religion. It's the idea that when you start studying religious beliefs from the perspective of the individual, from a bottom-up approach, rather than from um, a structure such as a church, you get a very different perspective on how people are, are worshipping, how they're actually choosing and picking and choosing elements of their own personal belief structures. So it's applying those sorts of concepts to the ancient world. So looking at individual um, religious situations, looking at individual religious choices and options that are available. A central point of lived ancient religion is the concept of religion as always in the making. The idea that religion is never static. It's always dynamic. It's always having to shift and change to suit changing social situations, new cultural situations, different religious groups and cults are always having to make themselves relevant to either attract new members or um, you know, regain the members that they have in the face of new challenges. So it's a constantly shifting system, it's not static. Linked to that is the idea that every religious act is one of creative performance, that even the most mundane act 
how, however sanctioned by tradition, always has an element of individual creativity in it. And that individual act has the potential for future acts to then change and for a particular religious belief or set of beliefs to change in the future. And then finally, uh, the negotiation of social and religious authority. The idea that, again, we often put priestly classes, for example, in their own box to the side. But in reality, and this isn't something that's a surprise to us in, in, you know, in our own societies, social and religious authority go hand in hand. That the social authority that might enable somebody to take on religious authority in the form of you know, taking on a priesthood, for example, feeds back into that social authority because that person then has a privileged position with supernatural forces that can then enhance their social authority. So looking at the way that all these different aspects of social and religious authority mesh together uh, within communities. On the other side, the idea of phenomenology and embodiment, how we actually deal with objects, material culture, some of the, the different approaches that have been coming out in recent years to approaches to material culture, which is obviously central to museum displays, and how we can engage with these. So this is covering things such as um, the multi-sensory aspects of, of religious objects and experience. I'll, I'll show some examples of, of these in, in a second. Um, yeah, so the use not just of, of the visual impact of objects, but about the smell, taste, touch, etc. I don't think umami comes in as one of the senses in this particular thing, but it might do. Um, looking at materiality, um, the importance actually of materials, not just of finished human objects, but of the raw materials themselves and the significance of, of raw materials in showing how and, and the production process these objects turn out. It's part of what's, what's become termed as the, the ontological turn or the post-human turn, the idea that rather than seeing human beings as, as above the natural world, seeing us as, as an intrinsic part of it, that everything we do, everything that we make comes from a symbiotic relationship with the natural world, not from some superior position above it. So yeah, can we engage with that sort of ideology when we're displaying religious material? Embodied interactions with material culture is about obviously how people are using and wearing objects, not just that they are touching and wearing things, but how they're doing it and how that affects their daily lives and their interactions with each other. And then linked to that, religious movement and gesture. Um, we know from lots of anthropological studies of religion that the physical objects are often the least important part of, of a religious act. It's what's said, it's what's spoken, it's what's felt, it's, what, it's what's done with them rather than the object themselves. But obviously we tend to put the object in the prime place as if that's the, you know, the major aspect of the religious act. So trying to regain some balance and how in displays can we start to get to some of those less tangible elements of religious belief and action. So just a quick look at some of the, the things I've, I've just mentioned there. Um, smellscapes are an interesting concept. Um, this is a bit of research done by Tom Derrick a couple of years ago on the, the Fort and Vicus at Vindolanda. Uh, but looking at, as, as you can see, the, the different predominant smells of, of different areas of the site, particularly looking at the prevailing wind direction is a very important factor in all of this. Um, but not just looking at you know, what, what smells might have been engaged with at different parts of the site, but looking at how that actually influences people's engagement with the site on a social level. You know, how people moving around the site might have known where they were in the site because of the different smells they were encountering. How that might have affected their actions. You know, that when you suddenly start to come across the smell of incense from a religious site, how that might change your language and your movement and the, the clothing you're permitted to wear, etc. So how that's an integral part of how we engage with landscapes and sites and each other. So smell is a really interesting aspect of religious practice. Looking at materiality, um, you may recognize on the left there, one of the, uh, the very famous um, curse tablets or, or prayer, prayers for justice, as they're often termed, uh, from Bath. And the idea of these as lead, the, the ones from Bath are actually a, um, a lead tin alloy, they're actually pewter, but we'll refer to them as, as lead as a basic thing here. Um, often displayed as evidence of literacy, you know, of writing, what's actually written on them. But we have this primacy of, of, of writing. Anything with writing on it in archaeology obviously gets put to the top of the pile. And things like this are often displayed in that context. But materiality approaches are looking at the material itself, of thinking the lead, the weight of the lead. Why has that been chosen as a material? If you have a, you know, a piece of oxidized lead and you're scratching into it with a, with a sharp point, you're, you're creating not just the characters, but yeah, there's, a, there's a shine to the characters. There's a different texture and a different reflex, uh, reflectivity of the characters you're creating. There's the physical action of actually carving into the lead. It's a much different experience to writing on a wax tablet or on a, on a parchment. You've got the physicality of rolling or folding the lead that happens with most of these, these particular tablets before they're deposited. So the material is a fundamental part of the religious experience of turning a flat piece of, of dull metal 
into a, a powerful, charged religious object that's going to have some real efficacy in your life. And you consider the content of these, where thieves are being here charged with all kinds of horrific diseases and death, potentially somebody else's life as well. But the material is an intrinsic part of how this has been experienced. Similarly, on the right, um, this is one of a, a small but lovely collection we have in this country of uh, jet gorgonea pendants. So images of the, the gorgon. Um, it's an apotropaic symbol, so it's there to ward off evil, you know, to, to keep evil away. But I mean, I've chosen this as a particularly nice example, but lots of the examples we have are very worn. They're worn almost smooth. Um, and it's this idea that perhaps wearing the pendant on its own isn't enough. Maybe, you know, the, so jet has electrostatic properties, so the rubbing of the jet may be part of the, the actions needed to activate its, its magical powers. So again, just saying it's an amulet and you wear it isn't enough. There's, there's embodied ritual, there's embodied movement and action to engage with the object to activate it. So it's, materiality is about how do we get those sorts of concepts across um, to, to visitors and to our audiences. Wouldn't be a Roman religion talk without some pictures of, uh, of a phallic imagery at some point. Um, but just to, to briefly delay on these, um, again, an apotropaic image, something designed to ward off evil, but again, they, they, but they tend to be treated as if they were a, a single phenomenon. But we find them in different materials, copper alloy, bone, gold, um, here. And we see them in a variety of forms, as you can see here, the one sitting um, center bottom is intended to lie flat horizontally with the body. Others, like the one on the right, lie up and down vertically against the body. Um, others, like the one center top, are more shall we say, enthusiastic in their, in their form. <laughs> and perhaps what we're seeing with this is, let's say, not one single phenomenon, um, but a range of, of forms that could have been engaged with by different people at different times and with differing magical needs. Perhaps some are more passive, perhaps some are more outwardly aggressive in their ability to, to ward off um, you know, curses or, or ill effects. And there's been some really interesting work on this by an American scholar called Alyssa Whitmore, who got hold of a um, a, a reconstruction of a phallic pendant from Piercebridge in County Durham. Um, persuaded, convinced, bribed one of her friends to wear one around for a while. You can see him on the, on the left there. Um, and measured how the pendant actually moved and engaged when he was doing various actions. And one of the things she found was that it, it was constantly in motion. That's the thing. It's constantly dancing around, constantly being activated. And maybe that, again, is part of the efficacy. It's not just that it's being worn and statically hanging there. It's the fact that you can see that this amulet is actually engaging with the world around you. And again, perhaps that's part of its efficacy. Linked to this, I suppose, is also the idea of the social thing. Yeah, if, you're, if you're wearing this walking down the street, what do the other people seeing you think? Um, not just, there's a weirdo, I need to stay away from this person. But, you know, are they in some kind of need? Are they a bit tainted by the fact that they've got to wear something like this to ward off, you know, some bad fortune that they're experiencing or... Or do you go up and give them a hug because obviously clearly they're in need and that, yeah, they feel the need for some protection. Yeah, there's a social aspect to this sort of outward gesture as well as the perceived efficacy of the, the movement of the object. But it's, it's getting to these sorts of interpretations from objects that are lying flat on plinths behind glass in displays. That, that's, that's the challenge. I'm not proposing any answers to that. I'm just saying I think that's something we need to try and move towards. So that's part of this idea of kind of moving towards experience-led approaches to display and interpretation. Can we start thinking about moving towards displays of religious material that place it within its social, political, and economic contexts? Can we start to consider the personal experiences of religious actors and their, how they might have considered religious change and even religious tension? Um, acknowledging the significance of materials and of multi-sensory experience, of engaging with sometimes non-overt religious material in religious contexts, you know, not just seeing religion as, forming, as being formed by the statuette of the named deity, but looking at all of the massive, otherwise everyday secular material that comes from religious sites, and conversely, looking at ritual activity outside of, of formal sites such as temples, engaging with the structured deposition in all these aspects of ritual that we see across settlement sites across Roman Britain. Recognizing greater variety in practices, geographically and chronologically, um, and engaging with issues, as I said before, of religious authority and power, and, and seeing religion not just as a spiritual thing, but as a very social, human dimension to life. So just to finish off, I just want to look at one particular category of, of object um, in the form of altars, something that pretty much everybody here will, will have if they have a Roman collection. Um, interesting items in the sense that they have their own problems in that they're big, they're heavy, they're difficult to move. And what we tend to find, of course, is that we display them 
en masse in, in big groups together. So displayed in a big group and, and losing, we have to say, I think, um, a sense of what their individual original context may have been. Because alters, when they're found, are found in a whole range of, of different archaeological site contexts, but we, we group them together and homogenize them in this, in this way. We tend to find that the imagery on alters isn't really engaged with that much, particularly the imagery at the sides, which is often you know, hidden when it comes to display. The term altar is, is actually quite a difficult one. As I mentioned before, we have the problems of, of visitors bringing their own concepts of what an altar is, um, usually based on Judeo-Christian concepts of, of an altar as obviously a, a table. Um, I think some of the, the visceral and grisly realities of what altars are actually being used for in terms of sacrificial altars in the Roman world is, is lost. Um, yeah, these are live religious objects that had a, a huge amount of power and presence and centrality in religious ritual that I think get, gets lost because they tend to be presented a bit like the cursed tablets, mostly as examples of, of literacy and, and of epigraphy. And interpretation does tend to almost essentially boil down to a translation of, of the Latin. So there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole, whole context of lived experience there that, that I think we, we miss a trick with the, a lot of the displays of these that we put on. Just as a, a little case study, um, some of you may recognize this. This is the, the lovely Mithraeum at uh, Carabruff on, on Hadrian's Wall. Excavated in the early 1950s, you can see the, the three reproduction altars positioned in situ there at the back. Um, this is those three altars at the point they were excavated. And you can see on the left, we have the altar with the lovely figure of Sol, and then two planar altars in the center and the, and the right, the one in the center having the lovely um, scrolled capital. If we look at the, the picture on the left there, you've got the three reproduction altars that are actually um, in situ at the Mithraeum itself. And as you see, they do reflect the order of the altars um, as they were excavated. On the right, however, the museum display has actually changed them around a little bit. You can see the image of Sol is in the center, which was something I found quite interesting when I was looking into this. I can only assume that a designer at some point has decided that to our modern sensibilities, placing the single figurative altar in the center and having the plainer ones on the outside presents a more balanced and an attractive display look. But of course, if there was any significance to the order of the altars to the original worshippers at the Mithraic temple, that's sadly been lost in the, in the specific display. You know, so we're changing the original religious context of these items for a more aesthetically pleasing look to our modern eye. And I think that's something we do need to be careful of when we're putting together displays and you know, retaining these sorts of uh, juxtapositions and relationships of these sorts of items. Similarly, when the altars were lifted in the 1950s, it was found that there was a, um, a foundation deposit placed underneath them. It's uh, not the easiest thing to see on the, the photograph on the left. You can maybe just see a little pot in the, in the bottom left. Um, the, the image, the drawing that was done at the time makes it a little bit easier to see. So, you know, a, a foundation deposit, a pit deliberately dug, offerings placed in it before the altars themselves were constructed. So clearly an important part of the ritual sequence of events going on. I think, possibly, in a display nearby, the little beaker at the bottom there might be from that particular foundation deposit, but it's not clear. And what I think it demonstrates is that we have a sequence of ritual events, as I say, you've got the, the digging of the foundation deposit and the placing of the altars, but in the museum context, only the altars have, have retained their significance. Only the big objects with the artistic representations and with the epigraphy have been deemed the ones to, to highlight the religious act. The whole foundation deposit, which may have been just as important to people at the time, is the one that's been swept to the side and not being interpreted. So I think, again, it's interesting in how we reflect the totality of, of religious acts, rather than just selectively picking certain items that we think are more display worthy. You know, so there's that representation of, of the whole holistic act. Similarly, we often have reconstruction drawings um, of altars in use, um, and, yeah, traditional drawings like the one on the, the left, sometimes uh, video reconstructions like the, the still on the right. And in many ways, these can be quite engaging. You know, these are good, interesting, often low to medium cost, depending on how expensive the artist is, um, ways of getting into putting people back into the seams and putting objects back into their contexts. But again, there are potential issues with these sorts of drawings. If we just use this one on the left, and this isn't here to, to specifically knock this drawing, but if we if we look at things from the perspective of lived religion, from vernacular religion, there are a lot of questions we might ask about the religious processes that the image doesn't answer for us. So, for example, who is the dedicant in this scene, or who are the dedicants? Yeah, that, that's the person who is central to the religious act. But here, we're not sure who they are. The priest has actually been placed front and center, not the original dedicator. 
Who are the other observers around the edge? Is this an exclusive group? Are they related in some way? Are they a community? Have they traveled far to be at that particular location? There are no children in the image. Is that something that's particularly significant? What is their social rank? They all seem to be fairly well-dressed and you know, look respectable in that sort of sense. Is this a public act or is it a private act? Could anybody come along and witness this act or was it restricted as to who was allowed to be present and to witness it? What actually is the offering? There's actually no sense of what's being offered here to the particular deity, be it animal or, or plant or any other kind of libation. Um, but who chose that offering? Who, who was it chosen by? Uh, why was it chosen? And how will the success of that act and that offering be, be determined by those present? Where actually is this taking place? Who owns it? You know, who has a financial stake in this particular religious institution? Could this specific act have taken place somewhere else, at a different location or at a different time of day or year? How specific is the act to the specific deity being worshipped? Why is that deity being chosen? Is there a relationship between these people and that deity? Or is this a, a one-off choice that's been, that's been made at this moment? Who's paid for the ritual? Um, animals, oils, anything involved in the sacrificial process are expensive. So what are the social and economic ex uh, relationships and networks that have been required for this sort of act to come together and to be possible and feasible um, and, you know, and a realistic thing to expect people to do? What might a scene like this smell like? What might it sound like? What might it even taste like? What are the, the actions and sounds that are required by the people present or, or prohibited to make the act uh, deemed a success? You know, what if, if somebody makes noise during this act, does that invalidate the whole, the whole process? You know, what are the social and religious conventions to being present at the, at the act? These are the last ones, I promise. <laughs> What's the ongoing relationship between the observers and the priest? Is, is this a one-off relationship or is there some you know, connection over a longer period of, of time? Is he the only religious official there? There is somebody at the bottom left who seems to be sweeping. Is he part of a wider religious ensemble present or not? Is there any social stigma attached to this specific act or, or observing it? Are there other people in the community that might have disapproved of what's going on here? Or was it universally accepted as a perfectly normal and, and sensible thing to do? Is the act typical of the whole of Roman Britain and across the whole span of the four centuries of, of Roman Britain? And then finally, is this a, a singular one-off act or are we actually witnessing one stage in a whole series of ritual, um, either public or private motions that may have involved, for example, the votive deposition of objects, uh, that may have involved the, the speaking or the singing of, of prayers, other sacrificial offerings, dancing, feasting, the wearing of specific clothes or charms or amulets, you know, all of these potentially connected things. We're just seeing a, a snapshot of one particular moment in time. And it leaves me perhaps a little bit controversially, but just to suggest, is actually what's happening in an image like this a concept of what religion is that's grounded in Judeo-Christian perceptions of what religion is actually being subconsciously transmitted? that you have a priest who is front and center and clearly the focal point, you have an altar in front of him, you have a congregation gathering around. You know, is, is there a sense that we're actually subconsciously giving out that sort of impression to visitors that religion is essentially what we would consider religion just with some, some funny clothes? Not to say that everything's um, bad in that sense. There are some interesting ways of altars being used in, in, in museum displays that I just want to finish with. Um, so for example, here where you have a, an altar to Fortuna, um, that was discovered in a bathhouse and has been placed back into that gaming and gambling context. So the idea of somebody, you know, praying for, for luck while they're losing at a game of dice, I think does at least give religion a, a far more social and, and human dimension. You know, it takes it off its pedestal a little bit when you can imagine that sort of, that sort of context being engaged with. Um, the recently reopened uh, Musée de la Romanité in Nîmes has got a, a lovely collection of Roman stonework and they've started doing projections directly onto their stonework. So a lot of their tombstones have nice projections on here is a, an altar to uh, Jupiter Optimus Maximus where they've got this rolling projection of, of various offerings at that altar being made. So a, a direct connection because it's been projected directly onto the, the text is a nice way to engage people with some of the processes involved. A little bit closer to home, um, this is Hadrian's Wall. This is the, uh, the Clayton Museum on Chester's, um, fairly recently renovated and, and very successfully, uh, I have to say, where they have a, you know, a Victorian collection of stonework. So the mass of stonework is very much the, the aim and, and the look that's, that's wanted. But what they've done there is created this little shrine. I don't know if anybody's been to, been to see this, um, but there is a little shrine as you go in. So you can take a lamp, you can place your lamp on the little uh, cup, uh, you know, almost like the focus of an altar. And um, you get three lights placed in it by the goddess Juno, who's here in the center of the little animation. Um, she has a lovely soft Geordie twang to the voice. I did this three times just for the voice. 
Um, and then you take your little lamp with your lights around the museum, and there are a whole range of, of deities represented in the collections where you can put your lamp against it, one of your lights goes out. You know, you're making your choice of the three deities that you want to uh, particularly engage with. And then when you go back, you get reminded about you know, the promises that you've made to those specific deities in a nice little printout telling you about those gods. So that, that sense of, of selection and choosing certain deities for certain things, it's, it's a, a really nice, um, simple, but, but effective interactive. So just to finish then, what am I actually going to be doing over the next couple of years? Uh, my aim is to get around to about 80 museums, um, selected to hopefully cover a decent geographical range and a, a range of types and, and governances of, of museums across the country. So that's what I'm starting on now and embarking on. Um, I'm hoping to be able to interview as many curators at these museums as possible. So uh, please do look kindly on me if you, if you suddenly get a a call from me out of somewhere saying, please, can I just have a, an hour of your time for an interview? I will try and buy people coffee as a thank you whenever I can. Um, so yeah, getting around, doing the, the surveying of displays at all of these different, different sites, doing the surveys with, with curators. And I've also got um, a public survey live at the moment just to try and capture a wider perspective on people's opinions and thoughts and ideas on Romana British religion and their museum visiting habits, um, which is there. If you, if you have the technology to scan, you can scan the QR code directly from here. Um, I have got little reminder printouts with me, so if you, if you, would, if you are kind enough to, to consider wanting to, to fill this in, I can give you a little bit of paper with the, the link on as well. But just trying to, yes, yeah, they capture where people are in their understanding and their perceptions of, of Roman and Romana British religion. Um, but at that point, I will stop. Thank you very much.